Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Welcome to Everything Cooperative this wonderful Thursday morning. And listen, we've got a nice strategy to talk about today of how to empower rural America. And Mr. Michael Peck from One Worker One Vote dot org is on the line with us. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Vernon. How are you? Thank you so much. Thank you for being up and with us this morning. No, you just came off of travel, so we really appreciate your time here. And really want to get into your proposal for Make Rural America Great Again. It's fascinating. What is this about? So, first of all, Vernon, thank you so much for uh, reading it and then, you know, of course, having me on your show. So, the current administration has announced well, has indicated it's going to announce a $1 trillion infrastructure program. Wait a minute. What's $1 trillion? That's a million, a billion, a trillion. That is a billion, billion. A billion. (laughs) That's big. I I got it huge. Okay, I I don't even know the number zeros, 9, 10, 12. That's like not eight figures, but, you know, beyond eight figures. You're talking 10, 12, 14 figures there. It's a lot of money. All right, a lot of money. One trillion dollars of infrastructure. One trillion dollars, right. One trillion dollars for infrastructure. And a lot of that infrastructure is going to be roads, bridges, airports, tunnels, and things that we totally need throughout America, but a lot in rural America, you know, which is the part of the country that voted overwhelmingly for our president. And so the idea is if we understand Who are the people that voted? Um, How could they best be served by this infrastructure program? Uh, And that was the purpose of the paper, making rural America great uh, again through this infrastructure project. So our sense is that, you know, over 42 percent of organized labor voted for uh, President Trump. And so did a lot of uh, rural electric cooperative and agricultural cooperative members. Uh, And, and, you know, we have 29,000 cooperatives in this country. We have 350 million cooperative memberships in America, even though we only have, you know, 305, 310 million Americans. And so, you know, some people hold, a lot of people hold memberships in more than one cooperative. So So how, how many million in cooperatives? 350 million memberships, million cooperative memberships in this country, 29,000 cooperatives. And so if you add up uh, the the number of cooperative members in all the different cooperative communities that in the in the battleground states, uh, principally Michigan, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, that, you know, put our, our president over the Electoral College transom, and you add that to the 42% of organized labor that voted for the president. You could come up with a very logical conclusion that cooperatives and, and, and labor uh, really were two of the most important voter classes uh, for our president. And so, um, and what did those voters vote for? They voted for many things, but uh, they voted for good family and community sustaining jobs. Uh, it was a cry for help in um, industrialized America, in rural America. You know, we've lost 60,000 factories since NAFTA was signed. And for those of us who worked on the 88 Gephardt campaign, you know, it was never about uh, whether trade was free or not. It was all about whether trade was fair. Uh, And and so the infrastructure initiative of all the things happening to the United States these days, the $1 trillion infrastructure initiative would seem to be the initiative most closely tied to the direct welfare and future hopes of the constituents uh, that voted for Mr. Trump. And so, wait, wait, all right, wait, Mike, you know, Mike can sure. you, let me stop you a minute. I, I did something while you were talking, and I apologize for not paying total attention, but I was still back on that $1 trillion. And yeah. I got, you got a one, 
and then you got thousands, millions, billions, trillions, trillions. That's right. So that's 12 zeros. 12 zeros. All right, I just got a sense of how big that is. I mean, I just had to do that. So if he's talking about $1 trillion of infrastructure, and every time you say organized labor, you're really talking about unions, right, or organized that's right. labor. That's right. Um, I, I differentiate between organized labor and alternative labor. Um, organized labor uh, means unions. That's correct. Well, what's alternative labor? Alternative labor would be new immigrant communities, freelancers, people on 1099s. Basically, an increasing part of the U.S. labor force is going to become alternative labor. And if you believe some of the reports that are out there, maybe by 2020, uh, the majority of America's working class will be alternative labor, which is another challenge, uh, another challenge that the country has to meet to make sure that our, our working class Uh, continues to feel aspirational in this country and can rise uh, to middle-class status, economic status. So, uh, but just getting back to this... Well, I just just want to recapture a couple more things. You got 29,000 cooperatives, 29,000 cooperatives in the U.S., 350 million cooperative members, and you said how many million people are in America? Say between 305 to 310 million, depending on who's reporting it. Okay, so... Cooperative 40 members. Million, yeah, they, 40 million have double memberships. <laughs> all right, because I've had people on the program that say that they, when they grew up, they had they would belong to five different types of co-op, the credit union, the farm co-op that they, they bought their fertilizer for them, the co-op that they sold their products through, where they bought their feed and... Their, they, their food supplies, farming yeah. supplies, uh, uh, the so, general store, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, Okay. So you could have somebody in one, two, three, four, five different co-ops, and that's how you get 350 million cooperative members. I just didn't know it was that many, that big. Well, you know, back where I come from, we call that voting early and often. Okay. That's right, for the cooperative model. That's right. And it's true. In, in many rural areas, your relationship is with the farm cooperative, credit union, and the rural electric cooperative. I mean, those are three relationships that are right there in front of you. And if you go to Ace Hardware, or you get your insurance from Nationwide Insurance, or you buy organic valley milk, you're participating in other cooperatives. And so, right. you, um, you bank with CoBank or National Cooperative Bank? That's all. You bank with CoBank or National Cooperative Bank. Absolutely. All right. So you got all of these co-ops, particularly in the farming world. Particularly and, in the farming world. That's right. So you get... All of these union people voted for Donald Trump, and all of these cooperative members, particularly the rural electric cooperatives and, and the agricultural farming co- cooperatives. That's so right. it seems like he would listen to the cooperatives and the farmers, agriculture folks, such that he would be wanting to pay them back, if you will. Or and that is with this one trillion dollars of infrastructure, you're, you're signaling out is one way he could really help rural America. That's right, because. Um, President Trump is concerned with opening up factories and opening up coal mines. But what he's really concerned about is is bringing back a new culture of work to uh, rural and industrialized America, which has been so devastated by globalization. Again, 60,000 factories lost since the signing of NAFTA. And, you know, these people, um, as a country, we have been so good at creative destruction, but we've been so terrible at creative reconstruction. So, you know, supplanting factory jobs that were family and community sustaining, but more than that, they were ennobling. People had a sense that they were contributing uh, to the greater, the greater good of America. They, they were making something of value. That culture has now disappeared uh, in, in economic reality. And replacing those jobs with service jobs has just not filled the gap. So it's not just bringing back those good middle-class jobs. It's bringing back the culture and the aspirational belief that goes with it. And so you can think of this $1 trillion infrastructure initiative, if indeed it becomes reality, as a gateway uh, to making that happen. And if that's the case, then I believe it has to be designed extremely carefully to make sure we take care of the interests of the people who made this possible through their votes. Uh, And so the biggest worry I have is how will it get funded? Because if we bring in venture capital and we bring in hedge funds from the coast, mainly uh, people who don't live in those areas, and we do public-private partnerships, the way to get 
the money back after that investment is through tolling. And what, what, tolling, T-O-L-L-I-N-G? Tolling? Tolling, that's right. So in other words, that bridge that used to be for free now costs you. That tunnel that used to be for free oh, now it. costs you. Okay. That access to the airport that used to be for free now costs you. And so to me, the, the construction jobs that people will get are not going to be permanent. No construction job is if the project is honest and has, a de- has an end determination in sight. No, those, they will last for a while and then they will go away. But the tolling will go on forever. And it will represent another massive wealth transfer from the people in rural America to elites, uh, financial elites on the coast. Uh, and so the hopes for the $1 trillion infrastructure initiative, while good in terms of that local construction job will be quite detrimental in terms of who gets to pay for the infrastructure once completed. So, and who gets the uh, benefits of whatever that's right. surpluses that's right. or profit is there, and it normally that's won't right. go to the people. This is a community that during the 2008 Great Recession, they're the ones who saw their homes turned upside down, not because they did something wrong, but because the general marketplace signal was nothing connected to reality. So by playing by the rules, paying their mortgages, they the equity they had disappeared. Uh, I think every rising working class and middle class person in America has at one time, if that person has been uh, had the privilege of being a homeowner, has used the rising equity in their home to do something that their salary did not afford them to do. And I think everybody Everybody who's had that experience realizes that without that rising home equity, uh, their lifestyle would have been sorely crimped and their children, their families might have not had opportunities. So when your homes lose value and uh, through no fault of your own, which happened to millions upon millions of rural and working class and middle class homeowners, many of whom ceased to be owners after the Great Recession and became renters or even worse, became homeless, then you know, without the home equity as that as that as that piggy bank in your yeah. corner, you know, what do you have? Yeah, no, I got it, and it, it hit the black community extremely hard. Also, whether it's, hard. it's it's rural or urban, it just yeah, extremely it, it's hard. devastated the the asset base of That's right. rural America, urban black America. Anybody that strived and got a home whether it's a co-op home or a condo home or a single-family home, it just really have hurt big time. And the wealthy made money going up, this increase, and they made money coming down because they were the only ones who could get the asset and buy it on foreclosure market. It's terrible, so I got it. This is, But why do you think, and we're going to take a break in a minute here, Mike, but what justifies this program you're talking about putting labor together with the cooperatives to get a big piece of this infrastructure. And we'll be right back to talk about that. This is it's a fascinating piece. I really like it. Thanks a lot. We'll be right back. Please don't touch that down. Information is power. That's the reason the National Cooperative Bank is sponsoring this program to give you information about cooperatives. So if you use the information, if you put it into action, you can have power to control your own destiny. And we're having Mr. Michael Peck on the line today talking about a way, a strategy for rural America to really impact their lives, to control their destiny. I was asking you, why would this work? What's the metrics you talk about for justifying this whole procedure that you're looking at putting in place? Sure. So if you combine the self-interest of uh, some of the stakeholders, the rural uh, industrial American stakeholders um, that we talked about, people from rural electric cooperatives, agricultural cooperatives, credit unions, local and regional small business owners, organized labor, people who believe that made in America is a good thing, then uh, I think you have a natural constituency of people who exercised their political voice in last November and now are in a position to participate in something transformational for them, provided the rules of the game are correctly structured. And what would sure. be the benefits of doing this for that group? What particularly well, because, cooperative benefits? Do you, uh, sure, sure. So I think there's a lot of examples of how stakeholder uh, stakeholder activities and local cooperative membership 
helps the community uh, to um, propel itself forward and, more important, demonstrate increased resiliency uh, during economic downturns. Uh, so the uh, first thing I would say is, you know, the, the track record that the rural electric cooperatives have had with economic development in their territories. Um, I would also say the same with credit unions. But when you're talking about infrastructure uh, and you're talking about the returns on that investment, imagine if we had a powerful enough voice at the infrastructure policy table that said that a percentage of the returns on that infrastructure investment went to the hosting communities as part of the payoff. Imagine if some of these hosting communities who are choosing between their library and keeping their traffic lights open or keeping um, uh, an extracurricular activity in, in the local school going, imagine if they didn't have to make that Hobbesian choice anymore because they had an uh, ongoing stream of revenue that was carved out for them but from these infrastructure programs. So I, I think we really need to look carefully at the profit flows and make sure that stakeholders have a percentage share um, and that it just is not all pumped back to the owners of capital, but pumped also to uh, the suppliers of labor. And, and I think this is somewhere, this is, this is, this is a basic uh, premise uh, where the communities I talked about, the local stakeholder communities, have a big motivation to get together and be part of this conversation. And on a national level, people designing how these programs should work should make sure they're included as part of that conversation. Now, you make some tremendous points I want to go back to, but there's one point that I want to emphasize a little bit more that you made, and that is when I read your paper, it said that worker employee, the owner of these enterprises, would earn more in income and retirement than traditional firms. And this is what I've noticed with co-ops. They just earn more. And I've talked about this. There's a, a book out, Communities Building Wealth. And it talked about a lady named Christina who was a Mexican immigrant who was a house cleaner, just clean houses, clean apartment buildings, clean office space. And she was making seven bucks an hour. And when they, when they created the worker cooperative, she went up to 20 bucks an hour. And it gave her the luxury of working less hours and spending more time with her family. And so that's the re one of the reasons I like co-ops and I love what you're talking about here. Um, so that's one of the things I just wanted to emphasize a little bit more. But you've made another point twice. You uh, organized this group and that they can have a powerful enough voice. And that's the piece that I want to know. How do you do that? How do you get this group organized so that they can be at the table when the policies and the program are created so that that money will stay in those communities and go to the people that need it the most, the everyday working person? Well, let's talk about that, mm -hmm. uh, Vernon. You know, I think it, just to touch a little bit on what, what you said earlier, it's true that uh, worker-owned enterprises – you know, earn more in income and retirement. Uh, but the other part of it is equally true, and that is that they appear more resilient, both on the startup level, you know, surviving the first five critical years, but also better fiscal health when there's a recession. And this is so important because, you know, it's not whether you're going to get a blow to your livelihood or not. All of us have experienced downturns and setbacks, but it's what we do about them yep. uh, that separates failure from success. And when you have a voice and a vote, when you have workplace democracy, when you have uh, the ownership ethos, the metrics are now in by very established schools, Harvard Business School, Rutgers University, University of, 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 of Wisconsin at Madison, uh, great schools across the country are proving with metrics, studying enterprises over time. Worker-owned enterprises, employee-owned enterprises are much more resilient and much better at solving the downturn challenge. And why is that? Well, when, when, when you're a worker-owner, uh, the worker part of you wants to have the highest possible wage. But the owner part of you wants to have the most sustainable enterprise. And the conflict between the wage 
and the sustainability uh, produces a sharpened focus on what's best for that enterprise at every single decision point. It creates a much more informed and empowered worker. And if you believe that all of us are smarter than any one of us, then it creates better decisions. Uh, People can figure out how to live to fight another day. They have the luxury of, of buying time. Uh, and not having a decision made on an extraterritorial basis that they're here today, gone tomorrow, because some bean counter in some glass tower decided that the global labor arbitraging of a few cents in the dollar was worth all that social disruption. I think we have such a credible opportunity to use this infrastructure plan as a catalyst to increase these types of enterprises across America. You said it so well, and that's why I like talking to you, Michael Peck. Um, <laughs> Thank you for Yeah, I, and, and I've tried to say it. I'm going to have to listen to this tape to, to get that the way you said it, because the, the numbers, ta- and you can correct me with what you know, is that for the average capitalistic company that starts up, in the first five years, 30% of them survive, 70% of them fail. And if you take the cooperative, the average cooperative starts, in five years, you've got 20% that fail and 80% that survive. It's just the opposite. You got That's right. So are those numbers sort of correct from what the research that you've seen? Those numbers are correct, and they're improving all the time. And the other thing I would say is uh, the beneficiary circles aren't just, you know, underserved working class communities, paycheck dependent workers, um, which right now, as I said, are more than one third of the U.S. workforce uh, and prevalent in terms of communities throughout rural America. But management and ownership also benefit as co-shareholders because they have a more empowered workforce. They have a more profitable workforce. There's more cohesion, there's more solidarity, and there's more competitiveness. So it's not, we tend to think of, um, you know, we tend to think of this in stark terms, zero sum, uh, I win, you lose. It, it's not like that at all. If, 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 and it's not about redistribution. It's about structuring these enterprises to prosper in a very competitive environment so that they're profitable by allowing workers to reach their full potential using ownership as the tide that lifts all boats but making sure that everybody's got a boat. It, but it's so strange if you take a look at throughout history. And I go back to the Zorro movie with uh, Antonio Banderas, yes. where you have the guy from, I think it was from England, he comes in, he gets all of the the landowners, the barons in a room. Yes. Spain, right. It comes from Spain. Spain, That's right. right. That's right. And they they decide how to how to dis, d- divvy up and divide up California. They got this right. huge, nice plan. I mean, it's critical, nice strategy, like your strategy. But your strategy is how to get the everyday person to benefit. Their strategy was how do you keep the everyday person down and even get them slave labor, put them in jail so they work for free, and to keep them down and they can keep making money off of the poor people, the everyday person, and then they keep surviving, they keep growing, they keep getting more and more and more. And that seems like that's always had been the the fight. You call, you talked about it a little bit earlier. So how do you get people at the table, the everyday people at the table? And we've got to take our second break and then we'll be back. I want to talk more about that. Is it what's your plan? for getting people at the table from rural America, everyday people, so that they can have input. If you're not at the table, you have no voice. That's right. So. Exactly right. We'll be right back. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, W.O. Hi, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. The program is Everything Cooperative. We're talking about co-ops. And right this morning, we're talking about a huge plan in America, huge plan that Michael Peck has put on the table. And right before the break, we talked about how to get this to happen. And, Mike, here's how I see it. So I really want you to address this. The issue is, and if you look at Trump's cabinet, 
more billionaires than ever before. If you look at his tax plan is to, as I understand it, reduce the amount of taxes that corporate America pays, reduce the amount of taxes that billionaires and the rich pay. And somebody then has to, to take care of that reduction in what comes into the federal government. And you don't know, take care of that by increasing what the 99% of you and I and everybody perhaps listening to this program would pay and or cut the programs that benefit the least of these or the elderly or the disabled or cut Pell Grants and money for people to go to school. So how do you get these people that are in power, the billionaires who look like they're putting in policies in place so that the benefits from these what I'm concerned about, the benefits of his $1 trillion of infrastructure would go to their pockets and not to the everyday person, and this is what your plan is. How do you even get their attention? Well, let me say this. I would say that in this administration, we have uh, a Secretary of Commerce and a Secretary of Agriculture, the Honorable Wilbur Ross and the Honorable Sonny Perdue, who have demonstrated uh, a lifelong capacity to work with organized labor in the case of Wilbur Ross and um, transform the U.S. steel industry and save a lot of uh, steel industry jobs. In the case of Sonny Perdue, someone I've known personally for over 20 years, uh, this is a person totally dedicated to the agricultural sector and totally uh, conversant with and a big supporter of cooperatives uh, with the little guy as his number one focus. So um, I think that while uh, there are, as you say, a, a number of people in this administration leading it who have huge amounts of wealth, I do believe there are leaders who understand exactly what we're talking about. And if you look at some of the organizations that could come together, and in addition to the industrial unions, look at this administration has done for Buy America. Uh, where do you think they got a lot of their ideas? They got it from the Alliance for American Manufacturing which um, has been something that organized labor, principally the steel workers, have been very helpful to throughout you know, the last 10 years. The Buy America policy came from, from that organization. You also have the American Sustainable Business Council. Over 250,000 triple bottom line businesses throughout the country and 325,000 business leaders. There's the Alliance for Innovation and Infrastructure. There is COBAC, which does infrastructure lending, and there's credit unions. And we now have, I think, over 900 credit unions that are also community development uh, uh, finance, CBFIs, uh, community development finance institutions. So uh, we have this Venn diagram of credit unions, COBank, National Cooperative Bank. We have uh, rural electric cooperatives. We have the Alliance for American Manufacturing, we have the American Sustainable Business Council, we have organized labor, industrial unions uh, that uh, were front and center when, when the president announced the Buy America Act. We have this community that represent the voters uh, in rural America and the communities and workers and families who need these jobs. Um, what we need is some national leadership to bring these communities, to make sure their voices are heard so that when the projects are allocated, they don't become regressive uh, when it becomes time for tolling. So how do you get these people, the groups that you just talked about, organized? Would that be the the Secretary of Agriculture and the Secretary of Commerce that you would look to to help pull, get these people together so they can have a voice at the table? Well, well I believe they certainly have a, a major role to play. But also, you know, this is a country that rewards those who help themselves. Uh, so I think that we have to organize in the labor community. We have to organize in the cooperative community. We have to join hands and understand common ground. And we have to do this in a way uh, before uh, the infrastructure plan is announced, not after it's announced, because there's a whole different rhythm when that happens. We have to make sure that uh, the people that depend on these organizations to defend their interests that they're represented. But it's not just a, this is not a sort of, a, it's not a resistant, a resistance activity. It is not um, a negative or defensive profile at all. This is about being really proactive. This is, for example, cooperative solar. The number one structure for solar around the country is cooperative solar. And the rural electric cooperatives are very good at it. Cooperative solar goes by many names. It could be rooftop solar, garden solar, neighborhood solar, block, block solar, like a neighborhood block solar. But what it all is is people, local stakeholders, pooling their assets, 
so that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts and people participate in that revenue stream. So power is produced and a percentage of that power flows back to the community and allows the community to do things it couldn't be done before. There is no reason why that kind of mentality can't be the overarching philosophy of all infrastructure projects in rural and industrial America. I mean, let me ask you, Vernon, do you think Flint, Michigan, would have had the water problems it experienced if that water utility had been stakeholder-owned and managed? No question, it would not have been. That's, That's really right. clear. And That is totally clear. And, and part of my mm, little frustration with your proposal is because I don't know how to do what you're talking about doing. I mean, I seriously tried to get Flint, Michigan, after it happened, everything I could do to get them to focus on this cooperative to not, okay, it's already where you have bad water. Now, how do you come together as a group of people and do the self-help thing that you're talking about and create your own water supply? You got a lot of water up at those Great Lakes and pump it in and own it so that the money would stay in the community and start your own food co-op or water distribution and start a, a plumbing company that's owned by the people in the neighborhood so that when those contracts are, are bidded out, then the people in the neighborhood would get the contracts and the money. So it's like, how do you get the turnaround and get the people? Same thing, Michael, in the election it was how to get the cooperators to to come together as a block to vote and really identify what you've already talked about. They voted for President Trump. He said 42, 43 percent. Oh, but how, right. how to get that done that, that maybe 42, 43 would have voted the other way, but then they would have been known that this is what the corporate world is. In New York, a councilwoman said, if if I don't get the cooperative vote, particularly the housing cooperative vote, I won't win. So it was very clear to her. <laughs> okay. Right. So how right. we get that together? Well, you know, I think I think it, we prove over and over again in every election in this country, whether it's federal, state, county, local, um, that economic interests are front and center. People in this country understand the huge embedded structural inequality that is almost like a tax on the productivity of everyday citizens. It is taking the aspiration out of the American dream. And, you know, the argument, the political argument is always about the government program versus complete self-reliance uh, or laissez-faire capitalism, or it's about redistribution uh, versus something else. And I think, you know, we really need to take all those little vocabulary buzzwords, put them in a safe with a triple lock and bury it some down, some, somewhere at the bottom of the Mariner's Trench because they, they are not helping. They are not helping a purposeful and productive dialogue in, in America. What, what has to happen is that we have to reintroduce ownership as the enabling mechanism that brought most of us here in the first place. We are a country that is built on the idea of individual and community uh, stakeholder ownership. And yet only 10% of Americans now have some ownership relationship with their work, their workplace. And so, you know, if we, if we could extend what the electrical utilities, both on the cooperative and the, and the munis, you know, there's about 1,800 munis in this country. If, if we could extend what they've learned to water and telecommunications, we, we would have a much more local living economy driven uh, result, which would be more fair. It would be more relevant. You know, the, the, everybody knows that high impact rural broadband is perhaps the single most important thing we can do uh, to increase economic development throughout rural America. But it won't happen correctly unless it's administered by local communities themselves local yeah. communities there's a voice and a vote otherwise it'll just be you know the private airport for the rich and the wealthy and the elites and the waiting in line for a flight that gets canceled for everybody else and this is what this is what america is experiencing and so if you if you remember the bernoulli effect it's one of my favorite engineering examples the bernoulli effect says and i'm going to dumb it down a little bit here not for you Vernon, just so i can explain it um if you take an electric current and you pass it along the surface of a deep hole, then everything that is in that deep hole at the bottom gets sucked up with that, with that current. So imagine 
inequality in America. Imagine rural America despair. Imagine the economic, the economic cries of the heart that were manifested in this last election from people who feel that their culture has passed them by uh, because they don't have a family and community sustaining job. Imagine if we use the infrastructure initiative that this administration has said it's going to announce as the Bernoulli current to lift all of that inequality, lack of uh, productivity, neglect, and closed factories and mines out of the dregs of America where they are right now, closed and jacketed up and exported overseas and into something else which we would call a new culture of work, which would be ownership-driven, where people, stakeholders, would have a voice and a vote, where we could practice how to do this right, uh, using, again, the infrastructure program as a vehicle, then we would achieve something transformational in this country. I love it. I mean, I absolutely do love it. That's why when I read this, I, I just had bumps all over me. It's just wonderful. It's just how to implement it. It's been my issue. And I like your Bernoulli example of pulling everybody up. And poverty, growing up in Bluefield, West Virginia, in the coal fields of West Virginia, Southern West Virginia, poverty is not, doesn't has no respect. It doesn't care if you're black or white or pink or green or male or female, fat, skinny, tall, short. It just doesn't make any difference. Poverty treats us all the same. And unfortunately, in America, too often when people talk about poverty, they think about black folks. And I believe very much so that racism still exists in America. So it's not as big an issue. But if they got the number of white people, whether it's in rural America or uh, urban America, that are poor and struggling and on welfare, then I think it would be a different picture that we could really sell this idea you have. Because it is a wonderful idea to pull everybody up. This redistribution of wealth, I'm not so concerned about trying to take from the rich and give to the poor, but I'm very much concerned about what you're talking about here, and that is for every new dollar that's created in America, that the 99 percenters or the poor, particularly the bottom class, gets more of that dollar than they get now. Uh, So I love what you're talking about. That's absolutely true, and I think if you look at the actuarial tables that insurance companies put out, what you, what you see is that the underserved rural white communities um, are dying across this country 10 years before their time. We've almost reached Calvinist predestination, where you can take a person by where they're born and determine what their life will be like. And this is a crime against the promise of America. And as you said, it has nothing to do with skin color or, or gender. Or, or it has everything to do with economic class. Economic class has become the new giant differentiator in America. And this is a step forward that respects our culture because basically ownership is a bipartisan approach. Um, uh, self-reliance, uh, bootstrapping, uh, civic equity, these are bipartisan terms. These we belong got, to everybody. Michael, we've got to take our next and final break, and we'll come back and talk about this because it's exciting. We'll be right back. Thank you, Bernie. All right. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOS, 95.9 FM. Back, everybody. The National Co-op Bank sponsors this program. You know, NCB, uh, particularly Mr. Chuck Snyder, the president of NCB, when I brought this idea to him three and a half years ago, he latched on to it and, and started supporting us right away. And we really want to thank them because in CB's mission is to support and be an advocate for America's cooperatives and their members, especially in low income communities, by providing innovative financial and related services. So what we've been talking about, Mr. Michael Peck, on the line today is how we work with those low income communities. We basically have been talking about rural America and what we were talking about, what he had just mentioned right before we took the break was somebody's life. And how they live, all, more often than not, depends on where they were born, their zip code, born and live, and not all of the other things that we attribute it to. Michael, you just mentioned the Acreero tables. I think it was inside Cleveland, some zip codes, black male uh, was expected to live 48 years. 
it was either 48 or 58, but in the suburbs of Cleveland, white male was 88 years. And it was just amazing, just right geographically, maybe 20, 40 miles difference, what the life expectancy of men, but it's not black or white, is where they live and how much income, education, hope that they may have in their life. So you're, what I hear you talking about is how to get this hope this education, this knowledge, because in the cooperative world, the fifth principle is education, knowledge, and training. And how do you get people the education, the knowledge, and training they need to manage that business and do the work and manage it? That's right. That's and it. it's right, Bernard. And so I'd like to uh, highlight the relationship that One Worker, One Vote, the, the nonprofit, um, I'm one of 10 co founders. Uh, we we're privileged to have with, uh, with CUNY Law School, the City University of New York Law School. CUNY Law School has been voted uh, overwhelmingly during the past eight years as, as the top uh, public service law school in the country. I mean, it's lawyers, it's student lawyers are literally in the streets solving the problems uh, they find. And uh, we work very closely with uh, Professor Carmen Huertas Noble, who is of CUNY Law, who's the founding executive director of the uh, Community Economic Development Clinic, CEDC. And they and also Roger Green, uh, Professor Emeritus at um, Medgar Everett College in, in Brooklyn, and others are putting together a curriculum uh, that will be very practical learning by doing dedicated to the community college arena of America, 50 million Americans in community colleges, uh, the practical factors of, of worker ownership. You know, there's a difference between worker ownership and employee ownership, and, and we don't really understand the difference. Um, employee ownership means that you have the privilege of being an employee of a company. So usually that means that your health care is taken care of. Uh, you may even have a 401k. Uh, you have a, con- a, a permanent contract permanent within the, 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 the parentheses of performance and the company's ability to prosper. Uh, but but most, most workers in America aren't in that privileged position. Uh, an increasing percentage of our workers are 1099s. Uh, they are freelancers. They're temps uh, or they're just unemployed. So what we've got to do is we've got to help those communities help themselves by providing practical education that teaches the nuts and bolts of ownership because ownership allows people, again, to not only participate in their enterprise as a worker but also as an owner with a voice and a vote. And and it, it, it has a direct effect on civic society. It produces more involvement in our democracy. It is a virtuous cycle. Uh, And it's not anyone's recent idea. I mean, President Lincoln, I'll quote him. He he said, uh, labor is prior to and independent of capital. Capital is only the fruit of labor and could never have existed if labor had not first existed. Labor is the superior of capital and deserves much the higher consideration. So that's President Lincoln. Um, And in One Worker, One Vote, we try to reflect that by saying, own your labor and rent your capital. So with these kinds of principles, uh, we're going out throughout America, partnering with amazing people, cities across the country, helping to put these kinds of new worker co-op enterprises together. We focus on union co-ops where labor and cooperatives come together, uh, that it's a cooperative uh, structure with a collective bargaining agreement. And uh, there's some big successes now. Um, And we hope uh, this kind of hybrid model approach uh, gets developed to reflect many other models. Because as you said, Vernon, we're an immigrant nation, we're a hybrid nation, we're a hyphenated nation. This is where we're strongest, and this is what we do best. Fascinating. I really want to get that class that they're putting together. We will make you student emeritus. I, yeah, well, <laughs> I'm always wanting to learn and that, how to get this done. So I really like your optimism and your looking at, uh, I, I gave the example of the glass half empty uh, with all the billionaires in the White House and the folks that get elected because of big money and they make policies that, that value and 
and help the money, people with money make more money. And you looked at, okay, but we've got the Secretary of Agriculture, the Secretary of Commerce, and we have all of these different organizations. And if we pull people together, you looked at the glass half full. That's right. And That's right. And so, no, I just, I just, I like that. And, and the question is how, for anybody out there to want to get more information or want to join in this right now, because this is, as you said, is we've got to get folks organized right now and active right now, because when this trillion dollars gets rolled out, we want to be at the table. We want to be at the table before it gets rolled out. So we have some say right. in how, what these policies and these programs will look like and who will own that's them. A, that, that's right. And I would say that, you know, One Worker, One Boat has, from from our founding existence, been based in the Midwest. And our live prototyping ecosystem is in Cincinnati. It's called the Cincinnati Union Cooperative Initiative. Vernon, you have been one of our esteemed visitors. You know the ecosystem of union co-ops that have been uh, started there and that are getting uh, national renown. Uh, I think, uh, you know, in this business, in this doing well by doing good business, we're really in the in the tire kicking sector. Um, people say, "Well, what do you really do?" And say, "Well, we try to build tires so that other people can kick them." And I think people should come to Cincinnati, see what we're doing in the Cincinnati Union Cooperative Initiative, see what we're doing in the Greater Dayton Union Cooperative Initiative, uh, the LA Union Cooperative Initiative, soon the Brooklyn Union Cooperative Initiative, the New York Union Cooperative Initiative, and and look at these enterprises, talk to the people, see what they're doing, and then go back to your own geography and try it for yourself. Well, isn't the Cincinnati Union Cooperative having a workshop conference in December Yes, they are. Second. They First are. And they are. And you go to their website, and they're having a, a. This is going to be the third major nationwide symposium that they've held. The first one was in 2013, and 2015, and now in 2017. And um, we've got hundreds of people coming each year. We expect a massive turnout. This is for practitioners and also for people uh, wanting to learn. Uh, people tell their stories. They answer questions. We bring in models that work. And people are very excited about the experience. Well, I'm looking to go again. I really learned a lot and met a lot of great people out there. Uh, you totally that's, love that. You can go to Cincinnati Union Co-op, all one word, dot org to get information about that organization. And you can go to one worker, one vote dot org uh, to right. get information on, on Mike and what is Michael and what is going on. Number one, it's, we use we use we we'll write the word out. It's uh, it's number one worker number one vote one worker one vote dot org. Thank you very much for the plug. Okay, any place else, anything else that's going on to get people tied into to this work? Well, I think that you know individual states are starting to take infrastructure uh, very very. Uh, very seriously. Um, New York State is one of those states where um, infrastructure has taken on an importance and also simultaneously so have cooperatives. Uh, the work that MIT CoLab is doing in the Bronx and in Brooklyn together with their partners, and One Worker One Vote is, is one of their partners, and, and also the work that Senator Gillibrand is doing uh, with worker ownership is extremely exciting. Senator Sanders just put two different pieces of legislation into the congressional hopper uh, last week. And um, we really feel that there's a bipartisan opportunity here to look at ownership, as I keep on saying, the tide that lifts all the boats by allowing everyone to have their own boat. Uh, and, and we're hopeful uh, that, that people will understand that this is, this is business 101. This is not predatory capitalism. It's virtuous capitalism, just as competitive, just as profitable, but with a much happier ending uh, for workers, their families, and their communities. Absolutely. Now, you've got about one minute to give us a last word on what you, to sum up all of this conversation, sir. So my hope is that the, 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 the white paper that I put together is uh, starting to get some traction. Um, very grateful that you gave me the opportunity to, to dialogue with you on, on your show, your unique show, Vernon, that uh, you know, I hope it's listened to throughout America. And my hope is that people seize this message as a way to really do well by doing something good and give the voters in rural and industrial America the new culture of work they've been crying out for and they deserve. 
Thank you, Mike. That's great. And I got a sense that this is also good for urban America everywhere. It is. We'll, get, we'll do it. It is. Thank you very much, Michael. It's been wonderful. And for everybody out there, please have a great week. We'll see you next Thursday and live cooperatively. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOM, 95.9 FM.